Hi, I'm Dr. Martin Simpson. I'm the director of the University Writing Studio at UF, and this is one of our supplemental assessment videos. It's meant for the students that are taking Dr. McKelway White's organic chemistry class. Um, we're producing this, the, the University Writing Studio. Um, we've got a bunch of tutors for writing that are available. We give you free individual sessions, 30 minutes apiece for people in undergrad and graduates. Um, we're also doing this in conjunction with the Teaching Center. Um, some of you already are getting great tutoring at the Teaching Center in Broward Hall. Um, for this course, but the Teaching Center also offers tutoring for a lot of math and science classes. You can find them on the web at teachingcenter.ufl.edu. You can find the Writing Center at writing at ufl.edu and find out about the services we have there. So today we're going to give you a quick um, orientation and some strategies to do really well on the these organic chemistry tests. Um, first, I'll give you a quick overview of structure. This video will work for both regular exams and, final and the final exam. For regular exams, those are going to be about four to five pages long. There will be four problems apiece. The points assigned to each problem go from 22 to 30, and there's a total of 100 points on the test. For the final exam, the numbers are bigger, pretty much the same idea though. Ten pages total, eight problems total. The points per problem go a little bit higher from 24 to 30, and there's a total of 200 points on the exam. Okay, a couple rules real quickly to remind you about the practice in that class. You can't use pencil on the exams, you have to use a pen. You can't use whiteout. Um, and there's two things you have to do to have your score recorded. First, you have to bring in a photo ID, and second, you have to sign the honor code. All right, one last thing, in terms of materials on the test, what is not allowed are the following. You can't bring your notes, can't use your book, you ha can't have a cell phone, or any other electronic device except a simple calculator. Um, the materials that are allowed is a simple calculator, not a, a non-programmable calculator, and molecular models. Okay, so let's look at the test. All right, so let's look at a, a sample question from this test. It's question number seven. There's four parts to it, four segments. Question reads that you should explain why the first segment is psyllyl ethers are good protecting groups for alcohols. Second part, explain why crown ethers can be used to facilitate SN2 reactions. Third part, explain why the Williamson ether synthesis only works for methyl and unhindered one degree alkyl halides. Hal halides I'm sorry. And the last part, explain why polar molecules have higher boiling points than nonpolar molecules with similar molecular weights. Now you'll notice about this question real quickly, you're looking for a short answer. It's a parallel in form in terms of the way the sentence the question's asked. As you see, there are four segments, and each of these segments are worth six points for a total of 24 points for the entire question. So now let's look at an answer that got six, the best possible score. And here it is. The successful answer must do four things on this one. First thing it has to do is state what governs boiling point in general. And so if you'll look at this answer, that first sentence is that statement. Boiling point reflects the strength of intermolecular forces. Second part, you want to apply that concept to polar cases. And that's going to be this part. Third part of the answer that you to be successful, you want to apply the concept to nonpolar cases. And that one is this part. Finally, you want to compare the polar case to the nonpolar cases, to the nonpolar case. And that is done here. So we've got an answer that hits all four of the questions that were asked for this for this. Um, segment D, and that is a successful six-point answer. So we've just seen the way, at least one pattern of, a, of an answer that would um, be very strong for the question that we're looking at. Um, and we want you to think about something here. What do we learn from that? Most students on a test are susceptible to a little bit of anxiety or getting, or worried about the time, something like that. For whatever reason, they will skim a question stem. They'll recognize a word or two that they think are important, that they recognize as important. They'll jump in with their answer immediately and start trying to talk about everything they know about that, uh, about that word or a couple words. 
What we want you to think instead is, think about to answer these questions, you have to think of the questions in parts. Take a minute up front to think about how do I answer each one of these parts and take another minute to think about what, how can I put these things in a good coherent order that's going to answer that question, that's going to cover all of those parts of the question. If you do that, you're going to have a much more successful response because in those two minutes you've actually thought about what is the process of trying to answer this question instead of jumping in too quickly and taking off without a clear plan. Okay, so now we're moving on to part two, which is how to make your professor happy, and all of you uh, have a natural interest in that. Um, let's think about scoring for this segment in terms of two halves. Four to six, because it's zero to six scoring. Four to six is the top half. Zero to three is the bottom half. What have you not been doing to get into this top section? Um, your professor has given us some great information here that we're going to pass on to you about what it takes to get a four, five, or six on this essay, on these essay answers. If you haven't been there in the past, we're going to show you right now ways to get there. Okay, let's look at um, a, still a strong response, but one that wasn't as strong as our first one. This answer got four out of six possible points, and if you can read it there, polar molecules experience hydrogen bonding, which is a very strong attractive force. Thus, in polar molecules, the atoms adhere very tightly to one another, and a high boiling point is required to break those bonds. In nonpolar molecules, the only intramolecular forces experienced are London dispersion forces, which are weak and do not adhere to atoms within a molecule, a molecule group tightly to one another. Hence, a lower boiling point can break those bonds. Now, here's the professor's comments. The yellow section that you see up at the top the professor's comment was, this misidentifies the major effect for the polar case. Some polar molecules hydrogen bond, but most do not. For that green section in the middle, the professor's comments were, this ties the interactions to the boiling point and correctly identifies the interaction for nonpolar molecules. And then the remaining pink one there, they adhere very tightly and do not adhere to atoms, compares the two cases. So that's a four out of six. So now we'll look at um, a very strong answer, another one that got all six out of six. As you read with me there, polar molecules have more intermolecular forces holding them together since they exhibit both dipole-dipole interaction and dispersion force, which increases their boiling points. Nonpolar molecules aren't able to exhibit dipole-dipole interaction and are only reliant on dispersion forces, thus they have neater intermolecular forces holding them together and thus lower boiling points. Now, the professor's comments on this one, for the sections marked in yellow, the professor said it identifies the interactions for the polar case. The part marked in green, the professor said it identifies the interaction for nonpolar cases. The pink part, the professor said this compares the two cases. And the blue part ties the interactions to boiling point, completing the argument. So again, another good answer. It, can, it has every single part of the question, and so it got a six out of six. Okay, so let's look at one final example of a great answer. This is a six out of six again, and in fact, the professor um, really loved this one, so this is a good one to look at. It was accompanied by two drawings a student did, and I tried to approximate one and wasn't able to do the other, but I'll, uh, we'll look at what they've got. The first drawing, um, the student had written polar molecule, approximately the same molecular weights, and they had the positives and negatives lined up, as if you can see them there. And then the student comments off to the side were strong intermolecular interactions and dipole-induced dipoles. And then drawing B, which I wasn't able to recreate, the student had said nonpolar molecule, again approximately the same molecular weights. And the student points were weak molecular interactions and London dispersion forces. So about these two drawings, the teacher wrote, drawings are fabulous. These show the change distribution and identify the interactions as strong or weak. And she wrote, this one is more sophisticated than the answer key. Love it, exclamation point. And you always like when a professor does something like say, love it with an exclamation point on an answer. That's a great answer. And here's the actual text of the answer the student accompanied those drawings with. Let's see if we can read it along together. Polar molecules have stronger molecular interaction via dipole-induced hydrogen bonding, etc. Nonpolar molecules can only interact with random polarization of electrons through London dispersion forces. These interactions are weaker than those in polar molecules. 
Consequently, it will take a higher temperature to break the polar molecule interactions versus the nonpolar interactions in two molecules of comp comparable molecular weights. Therefore, the polar molecule will have a higher boiling point than the nonpolar molecule. And as you look at the color coding here, here's what the professor said about the pink indication. This identifies interactions for the polar case. About the green part there, the professor wrote, then does it for nonpolar cases. On the yellow section there, the teacher wrote, compares the two cases. And finally, the blue section, this ties the strength of the interactions to the boiling point, which completes the argument. So that's the strongest of the, of the strong ones. Uh, it's got a six out of six, and the professor loved it with an exclamation point. Okay, so we've looked at some successful examples. Now let's look at some things that can go wrong with the answers. If you've finished in the lower half on uh, questions on past exams, you want to know what, that, what has made you do that? Let's look at some student answers that did not think through the whole question or answer every single part or answer them in an order that's going to be successful. Here we have an answer that got two out of six. Let's read it. The polarity of the molecule determines its dipole moment. As the dipole moment increases, the intermolecular interaction increases as well. Since the molecules are held more tightly by one another, it takes more energy to separate the molecules, leading to an increased boiling point. So here are the professor's comments on this one. For the sentence marked in yellow, the teacher said starts off by badly, in parentheses, defining the dipole moment, which is only marginally relevant to the question. For the part marked in pink, the professor said this is true, but there is a name for this effect. Use it. And for the green, the professor wrote link between interaction and boiling point is correct. And so the other comment the professor made is the question asks the students to compare the polar case to the nonpolar case, and there's no mention of the nonpolar case. So that is a two out of six. Here we have a response that received a one out of six score. Let's read it. The polar molecules have greater delocal delocalization of charge and stronger interaction between its bonds than nonpolar molecules. For this reason, polar molecules have higher boiling points. Okay, the professor's comments on this one, the yellow part that's indicated there, the professor wrote, delocalization is irrelevant, and this statement isn't true anyway. On the green part, the professor wrote two things. The type of interaction for the polar case is not specified. The type for the nonpolar case isn't either. And the other comment was, it's not interaction between bonds that matters, it's interaction between molecules. And then finally, the pink part, the professor wrote, the comparison between cases is made, but it's based on the wrong effect. Interactions between bonds instead of interactions between molecules. So this one got a, got a one out of six. Now we have a, an essay that unfortunately received zero out of six. Let's read it. A polar molecule has dipoles delocalizing the molecule. Bond lengths will differ from the nonpolar molecule because of the partial positive and partial negative dipoles. This allows the bonds to be broken easier Thus, the molecule will have a higher boiling point. Okay, the professor's comments on this one. On the part that was marked pink, the professor says this sentence is not true and delocalization is irrelevant to the question. On the part that's marked in yellow, the professor's comment is bond lengths are also irrelevant and they don't depend on dipoles. And then the comment made on the blue part is there is no bond breaking and boiling point, which is what the problem is about. The professor also has two other comments. At the end, the last sentence is not only irrelevant to the problem, it also shows the student doesn't understand the relationship between energy and temperature, which is critical for the course. And the comment, the, la the overall comment, this is a case where the student has strung together a lot of words from the course, but in a way that makes absolutely no sense and or is irrelevant to the question. No points for random keywords. Ouch. So that is a zero. And here we have one other um, zero answer. You might guess from the length of it. Um, the, let's read it. H bonding increases the boiling point of a molecule. The professor's comments on this one. This sentence is true, but it only applies to a small fraction of polar molecules and not to any nonpolar molecules. It's not specified which case the student intended to apply it to. And then the other comments the professor makes are a series of no statements. No identification of the interactions for either nonpolar or polar molecules. No comparison of the two cases. 
no link between the interactions and boiling point, and no credit for the answer. <laughs> the most painful no phrase of all, no credit for the answer. Okay, so we've seen answers to that one segment of the question that range from the strongest to the weakest answers. Um, the main point you're noticing that we're trying to hit here is that you want to take your time with each question. Give yourself a minute to look at that question, to look at the parts of the question, break it down. If you need to write some notes in the margin for yourself, do that. Make sure that your answer answers all parts and does it in a logically ordered way. So here we're looking at the other segments of Section 7, which we did not do before. So if you want to refer back to what those um, segments asked you to do, we'll look at those, the other three here, one at a time, with a kind of a key from the professor that uh, also assigned points. So the first part, Segment A, is explain why psyllyl ethers are good protecting groups for alcohols. If, you'll, if you can read the answer there, it's psyllyl ethers are unreactive with most common reagents, acids, bases, oxidants, etc., but can be easily removed with negatively charged fluoride ion to regenerate the original hydroxyl group that will protect the alcohol in most reactions. And as you can see there, the, group, the information highlighted in yellow, the teacher assigned two points for that. The part in pink, the teacher assigned another two points and the part in green got the final two points. So again, this is a kind of an answer key, and there's six, um, all six points earned on that part. If you'll remember the second question, or the second segment of question seven, asked you to explain why crown ethers can be used to facilitate SN2 reactions. And the answer there is, crown ethers can make ionic reagents soluble in nonpolar solvents by coordinating the cation and then the anion goes into solution by ion pairing, but is not well solvated. Since the anion lone pair is not hindered by sol solvation, its nucleophilicity is high. So in this one, you can also see the colors. tells you what the professor gave it. Two points for what's in yellow, two points for what's in pink, and again, two points for what's in green. So that's another six points out of six. And finally, segment three asked you to explain why the Williamson ether synthesis only works for methyl and unhindered one degree alkyl halides. And the answer was the alloxide nucleophile for the reaction is also a good base, excuse me. If the alkyl halide substrate is hindered, E2 dominates over substitution to make the ether. And you see there, three points was given to the yellow selection and three points was given to the pink. Okay, so we've looked over a, a, an overview of the structure of this exam. We've given you uh, worked through examples of strongest to weakest possible responses. We've ferreted out what your professor is looking for and the strategies you can use to satisfy all parts of the question. You've also had a chance to look at, uh, do a little bit of practice with the other three segments of question seven. I think the best thing you've got going for you right now is you have a very strong professor and someone who gives you a very clear um, organization for her test. She makes it very clear for you what she's looking for and how to approach it, and now we've seen some specific ways to reach that. You're going to find in your education that some professors are stronger than others at giving you really good, helpful directions. In this case, you've got a great one. Um, the, the parts are there. You know what you need to do. Now start doing some practice, and good luck on that test.